I had an interesting bug or glitch happen in Fallout 3 after I completed the main quest and went to start Broken Steel. President Eden just kind of showed up at the Citadel, and though I couldn't talk to him, it was nice to see him again. I'm not quite sure how common this glitch or bug is, but if you've had it in your game, let me know, and if you have any other glitches or bugs from Fallout games, tell me in the comments. In Fallout 3, if you travel to Fordham Flash Memorial Field, you can find a raider that seems to be carrying on the Great American Pastime. If you remain undetected, you will see this raider running the bases. While the rest of their group is out on patrol, this baseball enthusiast has taken it to the next level and will continue this animation until they see you or they are killed. I like to think that all the Kims are finally starting to get to the raiders' heads when I see something like this. In Fallout 3, we can find the Anchorage War Memorial. This is a statue celebrating the US soldiers who fought in the Battle of Anchorage, Alaska. In the add-on Operation Anchorage, we can see a photographer line up a group of troopers and tell them to strike a heroic pose and he will make them famous. This picture would be the inspiration behind the statue we see back in the Capital Wasteland. This is a great small detail that Bethesda added to the DLC. In Fallout 3, as you are leaving Vault 101, you will be ambushed by two guards. Bethesda added a great small detail with this encounter. These vault guards will pursue the lone wanderer all around the vault. But if we step outside the vault door at all, the dynamic duo will stop dead in their tracks. I like this attention to detail a lot. Though many people may know about this already, it still acts as a nice touch to players who flee the vault instead of fighting it out with the guards. Through the beginning of Fallout 3, we are led to believe that we were born in Vault 101. Of course, this comes out pretty early that we weren't. But you can visit the place that you were born in Fallout 3. It is inside Project Purity, the Jefferson Memorial, and you can see here that it's changed just a little bit, but this is definitely the room that you were born in, because soon after you were born, James would leave Project Purity in search of Vault 101, after Catherine's demise. In Fallout 3, you're supposed to assume that Colonel Autumn dies during the Project Purity incident when he confronts James. Of course, he shows that he has survived after the player finds the Gek. Many people have asked how Colonel Autumn could have survived such an event, and I myself didn't really know until a couple of years ago. Turns out that Colonel Autumn pulls out a syringe and injects himself with some kind of mystery agent. According to the wiki, it is probably a more effective version of Rataway or Radex. In the game files for Fallout 3, there's a set of power armor that really stands out above the rest. This absolute beauty of a set of armor is commonly referred to as the Heartbreaker Power Armor. It is all pink, including the helmet, and it is emblazoned with a white heart on the chest. Interestingly, it also features the Brotherhood of Steel markings on the shoulders. I couldn't find what the original plan for this armor was. Still, the developers of Fallout 3 decided to cut this PA set before the final game was released. This has to be my favorite cut armor in the Fallout series. Many fans in the Fallout community are having a fit right now, claiming they have a Mandela effect when it comes to a moment in the pit, the DLC for Fallout 3. People claim that you could eat Marie, the baby that has immunity to radiation, of course if the player has bad karma and the cannibal perk, resulting in the Lone Wanderer being 100% resistant to radiation. This was never the case, it's actually a mod called Acquired Immunity. Just wanted to clear this up, and a link to the mod will be in the description below. A member of my Discord pointed out an easter egg that YouTuber Bears798 had found, linked to their videos in the description. At the Galaxy News Radio Plaza in Fallout 3, you can find this sculpture of a rocket ship orbiting the globe. This is a reference to Interplay, the creators of the Fallout series, and their opening scene that shows the same logo. This is made more apparent and matches more closely in the Capital Wasteland Creation Club add-on for Fallout 4, which features the same easter egg but modified to have one ring around it, like the original Interplay logo. This is a terrific small shoutout to the original creators of the series that Bethesda decided to pay homage to in a beautiful way. Shoutout to Arctic Penguin from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, when we get to Canterbury Commons, we will see the Ant Agonist and the Mechanist gearing up for a battle. If we take them both out right here and now, Uncle Roe will bless us with some unique dialogue. Whew. You wouldn't believe how much trouble those two have caused in this town. We've been looking for someone to get rid of them for a long time. But you just walked in and cleaned up the town. Easy as you please. We're in your debt, that's for sure. I'm Mayor of Canterbury Commons. Think of me as your own Uncle Roe. And take this as our thanks for cleaning up the town. In Fallout 3, the largest slaver encampment by far is Paradise Falls. The location acts as a veritable Garden of Eden for scumbags, but it also has a cool feature with its entrance. You can actually open and close this gate, much like the entrance to Diamond City in Fallout 4, which I covered in a past video, just on a much smaller scale. 
The gate itself should look familiar, as we can see the tall boy statue is missing an arm. This appendage has been used to make a sturdy gateway into slaver country USA. Small details like this are what makes the Fallout series so great. Each little thing adds up to one of the most immersive universes in gaming history. Thanks to Garmfield and the Discord for suggesting this one. In the Fallout 3 DLC Point Lookout, many things are out to stop the Lone Wanderer. Swamp folk, sea life, and even a pre-war ghoulified Russian circus bear. We can find posters all over town about Ruska the Wonder Bear, but just out of bounds to the north of the Sacred Bog entrance, we can meet her. Much like the rest of the Yao Guai in Fallout 3, Ruska will be hostile unless we have the animal friend perk. Ruska is pretty big. According to the wiki, she's about 20% larger than other Yaogwai. Still, we can find her here, playing with her big red ball, waiting for the next group of swamp folk to stumble into her alcove. Thank you to Arctic Penguin from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3's Point Lookout, we find many dark secrets and shady characters. Shacks among the swamps and the hill folk in the area can keep an explorer busy for hours, but the trapper shack holds quite a pleasant surprise for those looking. Inside the basement hatch, we can find a few cells holding ghouls and one holding a swampler. We need to get into that area, so dealing with the creatures is a must. Once inside, on top of a couple of safes, we can find the smallest Nuka-Cola Quantum in Fallout 3. As if we compare it to the standard variant, it is dwarfed immensely. This is a great item to decorate your player home with, and is also a nice find for a bit of a pick-me-up when stomping through the swamps. In Fallout 3, the main quest will lead us to Galaxy News Radio, the stage for an incredible battle between the Brotherhood of Steel and some of DC's resident super mutants. Suppose the Lone Wanderer has the Power Armor training perk and finishes the battle with the Brotherhood. In that case, you can equip the Power Armor from the downed Brotherhood Knight. Doing so before talking to Sarah Lyons will cause her to have some unique dialogue where she seems a little tense about us having the Power Armor. I guess it's my turn to thank you. Anyway, the area is secure, so you're free to talk to Three Dog if you need to. By the way, because you helped us, I'm going to let you wear that power armor. But don't you ever forget where it came from. In Fallout 3, we can find a variety of weapons and armor to aid us in our capital journey. One of the more unique tools we can see is the Shish Kebab, a sword and flamethrower hybrid that can cause quite a wallop when used. Considering it's constantly on fire, such a weapon would likely be pretty hot to the touch. The developers thought of this when designing the shish kebab. As we can see, the lone wanderer throws on an oven mitt when wielding this flame stick. This carries over to New Vegas, of course, and we can see that when changing weapons, the oven mitt appears on the hand of the player character and others using the shish kebab. This, however, sadly does not carry over to Fallout 4, where the design of the weapon was changed just a bit as well. Still, you have to love the Fallout series' small attention to detail, and these oven mitts are a great touch at that. In the Fallout 3 add-on Broken Steel, we can find what I would call the worst hidden weapon, though this launcher was never supposed to be obtained anyways. After heading to the Rockland Tunnel and clashing with the Enclave, you can find this fence between two stone posts. This is where you can get this weapon legitimately by using 5mm ammo boxes to build a set of stairs. On PC, we can simply no-clip through and head to the location of the Tesla Cannon Beta. This Tesla cannon uses the same model as the missile launcher and also takes missiles as ammo. This means it can be repaired with missile launchers. While it may look like a standard missile launcher, it will fire the standard Tesla cannon shot. I call this the worst hidden weapon almost as a meme as it does less damage than its in-game counterpart and uses more AP. In Fallout 3, there is much to do in the Capital Wasteland. Whether you are chasing down your runaway dad or just taking a stroll through the vast wasteland Washington DC has become, there is always something a wanderer can do to pass the time. One of the most useless interactions in the game comes from an object most people just run right past without thinking twice about it. We can find a good number of parking meters in Fallout 3, with the most residing at Jury Street Metro, and we can interact with all of them. Usually, these meters show an expired time tag, which all adds up since these haven't been appropriately used since before the war. Still, approaching the meters and interacting with them will start a timer and cause the machine to lower the expired tag. This is perhaps the most useless interaction in Fallout 3. Thank you to Walta White from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, one of the most interesting locations we can come across in the Capital Wasteland is the Museum of History. Inside, we can find the Underworld, a safe haven for ghouls and a nice place to take a break from the horrors of post-war DC. We can find Carol here. She runs a restaurant and hotel, but I want to focus on what she has behind the counter today. 
Resting on the floor, next to where Carol stands most of the day to greet customers, we can find the smallest safe I've seen in Fallout 3. Inside, I found a few bottle caps for my troubles. Still, finding ridiculously sized objects is always fun in the world of Fallout, especially when we can make a few caps in the process. Thank you Nurb from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, just southwest of Tenpenny Tower, we can find Lucky's, an unmarked store in an unmarked location. This small shop has seen better days, but that hasn't stopped a scavenger from making it into a home. We are looking into this small store today because of a couple of unique items that we can find here. First, we can find a miniature damaged garden gnome. Fallout 3 has many hidden things that are smaller or larger than they should be, and it has been great seeing so many of them recently. The main event here are the sunglasses that we can find on the mannequin holding a hammer. These are the Lucky Shades, and we can only find them here at Lucky's. They look identical to regular sunglasses, but they grant a plus one luck and damage resistance, making them not only stylish, but completely worth stopping here on your next playthrough. In Fallout 3, we can find many items that'll help us on our journey through the Capital Wasteland and some that don't do much of anything at all. Whatever the case, there are plenty of things for the Lone Wanderer to collect. The heaviest item in the game is also one of the most useless, the Wood Chipper, found sporadically throughout the Wasteland. This item uses the same model as the Leaf Blower, with the massive difference being its weight, sitting at an astounding 50 pounds. The same is true for Fallout New Vegas, where the Wood Chipper tops the scales as the heaviest item in game as well weighing more than power armor sets and doing pretty much nothing of use. It's always interesting to find which items are the heaviest or lightest, and it's no surprise that a wood chipper would be the top of the mountain. I'm surprised that we can even add it to our inventory, but perhaps the back pain isn't worth collecting these when we see them on our adventures. In Fallout 3, Megaton will likely be the first settlement you come across after leaving Vault 101 a quaint, walled-in town made from old airplane scrap built around an active atom bomb. One of the critical stops while looking for your dad out in the Capital Wasteland is speaking to Colin Moriarty. He runs the aptly named Moriarty Saloon. Inside the saloon, we can meet one of the most likable characters in Fallout 3, Gob, a timid, frequently abused ghoul who works the bar and only wants to listen to Galaxy News Radio while he does it. If the Lone Wanderer somehow kills Moriarty, an interesting thing will happen with the saloon itself. Gob will take over the bar and even change the sign after a while to represent that he is calling the shots now. Nothing else really changes after this besides Nova giving up on the world's oldest profession to run the hotel. However, it is still a nice touch to showcase the player's decisions throughout the game. Thank you to Max from the Discord for suggesting this one. The Point Lookout DLC for Fallout 3 is a fantastic voyage into a murky swampland, filled with plenty of dangers to keep you busy for hours. One of the most significant landmarks most everyone will instantly see is the Point Lookout Lighthouse. Heading to the top of the lighthouse, we can see the bulb is broken. Still, we can find a holotape note that talks about a crash truck carrying a solution to this problem, and we can find it in-game. In between the detention camp and the cathedral, we can find the truck wreckage, and a brand new bulb inside. Taking this back to the top of the lighthouse, changing the bulb and flipping the switch will engage the light, and now we have a functioning lighthouse here in Point Lookout. This is an excellent small detail and really adds some personality to the area. To me, it's worth doing every playthrough. In Fallout 3, with the Broken Steel DLC installed, we can meet Scribe Bigsley, the Brotherhood water distributor spends all of his time at his desk, dealing with the other scribes stationed at Jefferson Memorial, or pulling his hair out over the problems that come with handing out clean water in a post-apocalyptic wasteland. Inside Bigsley's Project Purity office is a radio marked as owned in-game. If the Lone Wanderer activates it, Scribe Bigsley and the rest of the Brotherhood in the area will immediately turn hostile and start attacking the player. The boss is in one of his moods again. Oh, it's In the Fallout 3 DLC, Operation Anchorage, you can hear Sibley haze Olin about the person that came before you. Knock knock, Olin. Got a new best friend for you. What? Yep. Let's hope you treat this one better than the last guy, huh? <laughs> Go to hell, Sibley. You know that wasn't my fault. Sure, whatever. Just make some progress, okay? We're all looking to get out of here. And behind this locked door, we can find a Gary from Vault 108, Gary 23 to be precise. Looks like his arm is removed as well. So probably this clone of Gary couldn't comprehend what was going on and just kept saying his own name, so they removed his arm to try to get into the simulation, which didn't seem to work, or try to get into the armory, and that did not seem to unlock it the way they wanted it to. 
which is probably what Sibley is hazing Olin about. Shout out to Scan from the Discord for suggesting this one. Also, check out Loner on YouTube who has posted about this before. Link can be found in the description. In Fallout 3, we start our adventure literally at birth and go through our childhood in Vault 101. A tradition of the vault is to bestow each dweller with a Pip-Boy on the day of their 10th birthday. We see this in action in Fallout 3. After various shenanigans, the intercom will begin to ring, prompting James to walk over to it, engaging the rest of the quest. We can answer the intercom ourselves for a bit of dialogue with Jonas though, something that a whole lot of players probably didn't do. Oh hey, it's Jonas. Happy birthday. Sorry I couldn't be at your party. Listen, would you put your dad on? Can you put your dad on, please? Totally killer, though. Can you put your dad on, please? This was suggested by Squinty Narwhal on the Discord server. In Fallout 3, back at the 10th birthday party for the Lone Wanderer, when the festivities close, if we follow the Overseer, we can hear him talk quite roughly to the Vault Guard about the player. Enjoy the party, sir? Bah! I only showed up because Amata's friends with the brat. Give them a few more minutes, and then I want that place cleaned up and everybody back to work. Sure thing, sir. There is a bit more here that some people miss in this area, though, like the loudspeakers. We can interact with any of the loudspeakers that we find, turning them on and off. It doesn't do much but stop the music or the overseer's message from playing. Still, it's a fun small detail to play with when roleplaying your disgust for the overseer. Do not interfere with vault security personnel. In Fallout 3, when doing the Wasteland Survival Guide quest, if you're wearing the Mechanist costume when you get to the robotics bit, you will actually get a bit of unique dialogue. We're in the last stretch now, so let's finish it up strong. What's first? Oh, this is so exciting! I feel like I'm sending you out on some sort of super assignment. Okay. Okay, give me a moment to calm down. <sighs> now then, after some searching, I got this Robco processor widget. Supposedly, if you connect it to the mainframe at the Robco factory, you can get access to an army of robots. Seems like it's right up your alley, huh? And it'd be a great example of how to harness technology, wouldn't it? In Fallout 3, our search for unique and bizarre items continues. One of the best things about the Fallout series is how often you can play the games and still find things you may have missed. Inside the Tacoma Park area, we can find a hat that can go unnoticed pretty easily. On the corner of Carroll Street, we can find the Nifty Thrifty's Pawn Shop. Inside, on a coat rack just past the entrance, is the Tacoma Park Little Eager Cap, the only one of its kind in Fallout 3. Of course, this cap looks no different than the other hats that we can find in the Capital Wasteland. Still, it will increase the Lone Wanderer's melee weapons and explosive skills by 5, much like the Little Leaker perk. The Tacoma area of the Capital Wasteland is by far one of the most underrated locations in Fallout 3. There's a ton of things to find for the brave vault dwellers that think they have what it takes to confront the locals. Regardless, it is always nice to add another unique item to the collection. In the Fallout 3 DLC Mothership Zeta, the Lone Wanderer is abducted by aliens and brought to their mothership. Friendships are formed, and with the help of other captives aboard the ship, we fight our way through the Zetan crew and uncover great stories along the way. Once all the generators are destroyed, we will be tasked with using the spacesuit to do a spacewalk to get to the ship's upper deck. While we can have some fun with unique deaths here by not wearing the spacesuit in decompressed areas, there is another fantastic animation that only plays here. If the Lone Wanderer strays too close to the ship's edge, we will see them float away in probably the most unique death animation in Fallout 3. Environmental experiences like this are always fun to see, and it would be great to have more things like this moving forward in the Fallout series. In Fallout 3, drinking water from natural sources can be a great way to boost your HP at the cost of your rad count. Still, in the Operation Anchorage DLC, we can find something that we don't usually see. Outside of the playable map, there are large bodies of water. Of course, this being a computer simulation, the water isn't real, and though we have no interaction with water in Anchorage under normal means, Bethesda still accounted for this when adding water to the DLC. If we were to approach the liquid in Operation Anchorage, we would see that drinking it offers no HP regeneration, and it is also radiation-free. 
This is not something that needed this change, as if I recall correctly, we don't get close to any water during the events of the DLC. Perhaps Bethesda had planned for us to have interaction with the ocean or some lakes, and then made changes. Or they just made sure that the water in the Anchorage area acted correctly due to the simulation. Either way, an excellent small detail for eagle-eyed players. Thank you to Billy Wayne Sully from the YouTube comments for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, Megaton will likely be one of the first locations you stumble across. Town Mayor Lucas Sims will be waiting there to greet you, but we will be focused more on his house in this video. We can find an easily missable hatch inside the mayoral home leading to the roof. If we enter this portal, we will see quite the scenic overlook, and a good vantage point for the no-nonsense lawman. While up here though, don't miss your chance to visit Stockholm. No matter how difficult it might be, we can get to him from here. It involves some fancy parkour, but we can take the roof to the town fence and then perform a balancing act on that until we can jump towards the sniper. The more time I spend talking to you, the less I'm spending watching for raiders. How the hell did you get up here anyway? Thank you to Anthony from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, we start our journey as a child growing up in Vault 101 going through major life events like our 10th birthday party, which is the time that young dwellers get issued their Pip-Boy, an exciting time indeed. After the party winds down a bit, Dad will get a call from Jonas. This prompts the adventure to the lower floors, where Dad gives us our first BB gun and a rad roach appears. One of the most easily missed voice lines in Fallout 3 happens right here, and believe it or not, it's from the Lone Wanderer themselves. Injuring the Rad Roach and walking away from it will trigger the player character to comment on losing the enemy. This is confirmed to be the Lone Wanderer by trying both the male and female characters, in which the voice actor will change to match. This is the only spoken voice line from the player character with actual words, not just grunts and moans. I guess it was nothing. I guess it was nothing. In Fallout 3, the capital wasteland is filled with cool gear and clothes to find. While the selection is large, we can still find more when looking through the game files for Fallout 3, where we can find a ton of cut content. One of the cut armor sets has an interesting name, the Robo Thor armor, which can only be found by using console commands. While it looks identical to the Tesla armor that we find throughout the game, the stats take more after the Enclave armor. The Robo Thor armor is likely named this way due to its passing resemblance to the comic book version of Thor, with the helmet completing the look. I assume this armor may have been used for testing, and the developers gave it a fun name during production, ultimately cutting it out of the game before release. Mixing the armor with another cut item, the Discharge Hammer, a super sledge that does electrical damage, you can have your own post-war Thor fantasy against super mutants and raiders alike. And this armor is sure to put other heroes in the area like the Ant Agonizer and the Mechanist to shame. Big shout out to Zogun on the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, one unmarked location, Gold Ribbon Grocers, holds not only a classic easter egg, but some good loot as well. When entering the shop, we can find arrows leading us to a pressure plate, and once we activate it, we see that the store has been turned into a Rube Goldberg machine. These displays are chain reaction performances that were designed to complete a simple task most of the time. Named after American cartoonist Rube Goldberg. This site pays homage to its namesake well and even rewards us with a couple of missiles and a mini nuke. When Fallout 3 was released, this whole setup was considered pretty impressive, not to say it isn't now, but it was a great way to show off the game's physics. While filming for some videos this morning in Fallout 3, a bizarre thing happened to me that I had never seen before. I loaded a save right before leaving Vault 101, and as I waited for the DLCs to load in, what looked like a raider ran by at an incredible speed. I quickly hit the record button and attempted to follow him to see if he was going somewhere interesting. Still, due to his speed, I couldn't keep up. This isn't the weirdest part, as when I turned the corner, the game crashed, which is pretty standard for Fallout 3. But this crash was different. The task manager would not close the game. Even shutting down the computer wasn't closing the game, so I did a hard shutdown, and when I rebooted, Fallout 3, New Vegas, Fallout 4, and Fallout 76 were all uninstalled from my Steam. Fallout 1, 2, and Tactics remained. Keep in mind, these are all on different drives, some being on my main C drive. 
After this, I did a standard reboot on my PC and everything was back. And the man didn't show back up in front of Vault 101. I suppose if you see this guy run by in your game, watch out. Thank you to Baba Ganoush from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, traveling to Point Lookout can lead to adventure and some gritty experiences. It can also lead to the absolute worst weapon in the entire game. Deep in the swamp, south of Turtle Dub Detention Camp, we can find a box with a hockey mask on top of it, resting next to the toy knife. This melee weapon is almost certainly the worst that you will find in the wasteland because, as the name suggests, it's just a toy. The toy knife has the lowest damage of all weapons in Fallout 3. It is also the most fragile, breaking fast when used in combat for self-explanatory reasons. Still, you can get plenty of swings and vats because the toy knife uses the least AP out of all the weapons in the game as well. I would say obtaining this knife is solely for rare and unique item collectors due to the condition that it's in and the fact that it's pretty much useless as an actual weapon. It seems someone out in the swamp was having a bit of fun. Or could this be a nod to the pint-sized slasher? Let me know what you think in the comments below. In Fallout 3, the capital wasteland is filled with pitfalls for wary travelers. Whether it is the mutated life forms that call the area home, or dastardly traps set by raiders, the post-war Washington DC area is far from safe. It would seem you can't even use the bathroom without a chance of getting caught up in one of these traps. This leads to possibly one of the most hidden dangers of Fallout 3 the electrical traps placed on some toilets we can find in the Capital Wasteland. We can find one here in the Museum of Technology, and this pulse can give quite a shock to any lone wanderers who may be a little too thirsty for their own good. Powered by microfusion cells, wires are then fed into the toilet bowl, sending a charge through the water and anyone who gets too close to it. These traps are helpful for getting a handful of microfusion cells for players who have the skill to grab them without being electrocuted though the presence of these toilet traps will undoubtedly make you think twice before taking a refreshing drink or relieving yourself before inspecting the bathroom thoroughly. The reward for completing the Operation Anchorage DLC for Fallout 3 is access to a pre-war sealed bunker that holds relics from the period of the Resource Wars. The centerpiece is a pristine set of winterized T-51B power armor due to the DLC also rewarding the player with the power armor training perk required to wear the gear, this is a great way to start any playthrough, especially since the armor is indestructible, or at least it would appear that way. This is actually a misconception and a bug on Bethesda's part, leading many who played the DLC at the time of the release to think that perhaps the label of winterized was a way of saying unbreakable, when in fact, that is just referring to the snowy texture. Citing the wiki, we can see the truth behind the mishap. The version given after completing the Anchorage Reclamation Simulation is the Sim version, rather than the intended Wasteland version. Among other issues, the Sim version has abnormally high health, close to 10 million hit points, and as a result, will likely never become noticeably damaged. The armor can only be repaired by merchants. In Fallout 3, there is no shortage of junk to find lying around. The post-war DC area is filled to the brim with relics lost to time and items weathered for decades. One of the less common things to find out in the wasteland are the toasters littered about in various areas. Most of the time, we can find one or two lying around, if there are any at all. Every toaster you find out in the capital wasteland will show its age, all of them except for the one that we can find in Vault 101's cafeteria. This is a pre-war model and the only one placed in the world of Fallout 3. However, this isn't the only way to obtain pre-war toasters, as we can find them on rare occasions for sale at Boutique Le Chic in Tinpenny Tower. We can also buy them from Crazy Wolfgang if we have thoroughly invested in his caravan. This makes the pre-war toaster not only the rarest toaster in the game, but one of the rarest items in Fallout 3 overall. Of course, this is a must-have for rare item collectors and a perfect decoration for your player home. In Fallout 3, we can find a variety of one-of-a-kind weapons, armors, and small trinkets littered across the capital wasteland. These rare items can fuel adventures for the Lone Wanderer as we explore what Fallout 3 has to offer us. When we cross paths with another Wanderer, there is an opportunity to get our hands on one such armor set. Just east of Roosevelt Academy, we can find a makeshift raider base with a unique NPC patrolling it called a Wanderer. The NPC is completely random when it comes to appearance and gender, but one thing we will always find on them 
is the Wanderer's Leather Armor. Like most unique items in Fallout 3, the Wanderer's Leather Armor is identical to its more common counterpart. Still, it boasts a plus 10 to the small gun skill. I have always liked the design of the leather jacket armor in the Fallout series, starting with the original. It's clearly based on the look of the original Mad Max, and it fits perfectly into a post-nuclear world. Rare item hunters will want to add this to their collection if you find yourself out and about in the Roosevelt Academy area. In the Fallout 3 DLC, Operation Anchorage, the Lone Wanderer winds up jumping into a computer simulation of the Battle of Anchorage. This change of scenery and time frame adds a fun spin to the Fallout formula. The gameplay resembles more of a first-person shooter approach akin to Call of Duty. While we can find a plethora of new weapons and armor in this DLC, there was still some cut content that, while we weren't supposed to be able to access, still resides in the game and is reachable without any tricks, except maybe being a good jumper. We can leave the playable map area by getting on top of the rocks next to this pipe. The jumping is exceptionally tricky, so I recommend PC players just no clip to the top. Once up here, if we travel west of the field HQ, we can find six smoke grenades cut from the final game. Picking them up, we can see they do an okay amount of damage, but using them will show they pretty much just act like frag grenades, with no real smoke effect when deployed. These grenades are certainly some of the most hidden weapons in Fallout 3, and getting your hands on them can be tricky. Still, rare item hunters will want to add them to their collection for their day in the snow. In a previous short, I showed a clip of this location and got a few questions about it, so let's take a look. In Fallout 3, much like other games from Bethesda, there are a plethora of unused areas and map cells that still exist in the game. One of the most exciting locations you can't get to in Fallout 3 is the Test QA World Rock Creek Estates. We enter this cell by using the console command COC QA World Origin. This map is so interesting to me because we never see such a dense burnt forest in the game, and the vibe is perfect for the Fallout universe. Taking inspiration from the real-world Rock Creek Park, this is a sprawling demo cell with a few Mirelurks and Hunters roaming the area. In fact, it's believed that Grandma Sparkle's boys could have been placed here. While we can't enter any of the doors here, there is a cave entrance next to the Mirelurks and a house perched perfectly to watch over the canyon. Winding roads spread from the creek base and presumably would have led to the other areas around DC. The dense trees and shallow creek bed offer an excellent looking fallout location and it's great that we can see what the devs were thinking by visiting places like this. The Operation Anchorage DLC in Fallout 3 sees the Brotherhood Outcast trying to access a secured bunker. Most players on repeat playthroughs hit this DLC first because of the Unbreakable Power Armor reward. But, if you happen to show up in some Outcast Power Armor, you will receive some unique dialogue for doing so. The Outcasts are standoffish to outsiders, but they are pretty welcoming when they think you are a part of the group. About damn time the reinforcements showed up. Fall in, soldier. We got multiple hostiles between here and the base camp. We're sweeping the area to secure it. Let's move. Nice work out there, soldier. Thanks for the backup. But where's the rest of your detachment? Ah, uh, that'd be Protector McGraw. Sir, he's... he's inside. Go ahead, Ed. Ah, thank you for responding to our distress call. All right, follow me. I'll take you to Protector McGraw. So you're the one Marill sent down. Except you're not one of us, are you? I'll have to have a little chat with Marill about that. But you do have that computer there on your wrist. Hmm. I can see now that Marill made the right call. Maybe you can be useful after all. In Fallout 3, our search for unique items continues. While some sit ready for us to get our hands on them, others are hidden behind events that won't spawn into the game until specific criteria are met. One such weapon can be found if the Lone Wanderer targets the Citadel on the Enclave mobile platform, sealing its fate to be destroyed, leaving a crater behind. Inside the crater, we can see a door, and once we enter it, we find ourselves in some offices. One of the cubicles in the back belonged to a Herald Callahan, with a science skill of 75, we can read some of his reports and unlock the safe next to his desk, which is also locked at 75 for lockpicking. Inside the safe, we can find, without a doubt, the most valuable pistol in Fallout 3, which happens to be one of the rarest, Callahan's Magnum. Aside from being the most valuable, it is also the most powerful handgun in the game. The name Harold Callahan is a reference to the main character of the movie Dirty Harry, Harry Callahan, played by Clint Eastwood. While this gun is an excellent reference to the film, rare item hunters will want to grab it regardless due to the steps it takes to get it to spawn. A pleasant surprise for those who want to take an evil karma run all the way to the end. In the Fallout 3 DLC, The Pit, we are thrust into the broken world of Pittsburgh after the devastating events of the Great War. 
what is left is a hellish radioactive shell of what once was. One of the most interesting sights in the pit is the twisted sculpture of a human in front of Haven. With fire exploding around it and the looming tower behind the artwork, it really sets the scene for the vibe that the pit has to offer. Nate Perkopile, the lead artist for the DLC, has recently shed some light on the inspiration for the sculpture. Nate has cited that the statue was inspired by artwork he saw at Burning Man, the annual festival in Nevada's Black Rock Desert. The following year, Nate would return to the Burning Man Festival and battle Fallout 3's art director, Istvan, in the Thunderdome. This whole trip is referenced in Fallout 4 as well on a cover of Live and Love, where the developers are represented in the art. Nate has since left Bethesda and is now working on a game called The Axis Unseen, which he describes as a heavy metal horror game where you hunt monsters from folklore in an open world. Make sure to wishlist the game on Steam if that sounds interesting, and look for updates from just perky games. In Fallout 3, the Lone Wanderer has a plethora of different clothing options. From the absurd to the incredibly protective, armor and clothes are some of the most fun things to collect. Deep in the depths of Uptown in the pit, while it may seem desolate and cleaned out, one should still keep their eyes peeled for the next fashion piece to add to their collection. In the old abandoned apartments near the Raiders' primary hub, we can find a unique hat that is pretty easy to miss. In the first apartment on the second floor, after lockpicking the easy door, we can find an average locked safe. Inside will be some clearly Chinese-related gear, including the one-of-a-kind Hat of the People. The hat looks the same as its Chinese commando hat counterparts, but will boost your small guns by five instead of adding a point to perception. This fur-lined cap is not something you would expect to find in the pit, so it's a welcome surprise for people who are brave enough to search the blown out buildings in the hellscape that was once Pittsburgh. As always, I would say rare item hunters will want to make these apartments a permanent part of their journey each playthrough of the DLC, as long as you don't mind fighting your way through hordes of trogs just to get a pre-war Chinese hat. Shout out to Garmfield on the Discord server for suggesting this one. In the Fallout 3 DLC, Point Lookout, we enter a murky swamp filled with loads of things to discover, and one of the most impressive lies underwater just off the shore of the coastal grotto. Marked by a buoy, we can find these enormous skeletal remains of a T-Rex. The Fallout series has a fun history with the prehistoric, with devs even considering making the original game about time travel and dinosaurs. This massive dino skeleton may or may not be referencing that considering we can find a human frame here as well with a lever action rifle and ammo boxes. A safe nearby contains a bunch of loot and adds to the mysterious story being told here. This could be trying to make a reference to the original changed plot of the Fallout series if it implies these two beings coexisted, especially with such an advanced rifle present as there is no way guns were around at the time of dinosaurs, perhaps hinting at time travel. We can find a pretty much intact, but far less mysterious, Tyrannosaurus Rex bone collection in the Museum of History as well. Just more small details that make the world of Fallout that much more fun to explore. Shout out to Janichi from the Discord for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, we can find many small details and great examples of environmental storytelling. One such instance shows up between Vault 106 and the VAPL-58 power station. We can see a motorcycle leaning against a rocky cliffside. Before the drop off, we can find a metal box containing Patrick's farewell, a holotape left by a former US Armed Forces member, and the letter reads, Hey there, Tabby Cat. I know this wasn't fair to you. I'm sorry. Everything you've done for me since Anchorage, you were the best chance I had at making a normal life again. But I just don't think it's possible for me. You deserve a life of your own. Tell Mikey the bike is his when he gets his license next summer. She'll need a new toroidal coil soon. I'm also leaving the Kami pistol. Please take it to Dad. He'll want that. Everything else I leave to you. I know it isn't much. I love you, Cat. Please, forgive me one more time. Patrick. The note explains quite a bit of what we have already seen with the motorcycle and the pistol. Still, we can find Patrick's remains at the bottom of the cliff, with a noticeable dent in the ground where he likely landed. This is just a brutal small detail that makes the world of Fallout 3 that much more wonderful. Thank you to Honda from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, we can find a rather inconspicuous building housing a factory that produces the lovely Red Racer tricycles. The area is heavy with raiders, but those that push through will see that this factory is anything but dull. The best thing we can find here in the form of rarities is the giant teddy bear riding the massive trike hanging above the factory floor. This can be looted and, much like the other big bears in the game, will resort to a standard size if stacked. 
Going further into the offices, we can hear the same demonic whispers that can be heard at the Dunwich building, and any of the super mutants killed here will suddenly have their head explode upon death. This is the result of the surgeon, a mad scientist type at the end of this dungeon. We aren't focusing on his mission statement today, we are looking at the one-of-a-kind lab coat he is wearing that can be looted off of his corpse. It boasts a plus 10 to medicine and a plus 5 to science. Interestingly enough, if you wear the ghoul mask, the surgeon won't be hostile to you, and you can interact with him and use the armor pickpocket trick to secure the lab coat in a different way. So many locations in Fallout seem normal at first and then get more cursed as you explore, and the Red Racer Factory is a prime example of this. Make sure to follow the account Fallout of the Day on Twitter, who gave me the idea for this video. It's an excellent account that posts daily Fallout information and facts. In Fallout 3, there was quite a bit left on the cutting room floor. Weapons, locations, and even fully fleshed out characters got the axe before the game's final version was released. Luckily, due to how the Gamebryo engine works, we can still see much of what was cut. One instance of this is the unique baseball bat known as the Curse Breaker. This cut melee weapon is visibly identical to its common counterparts, much like most, if not all, of the unique weapons in Fallout 3. The Curse Breaker does a bit more damage than the standard baseball bats and has a better critical chance as well, meaning you will swing for the fences most times you square up with the swatter. The name is likely a nod to the Curse of the Bambino, which many baseball fans believed was the curse of the championship drought of the Boston Red Sox after the team sold Babe Ruth to the Yankees, which led to New York claiming the top spot in the MLB for years. I speculate this might have been found on a named Raider at Fordham Flash Field, which has some other baseball-related happenings. We may never know how it was going to be used, but it's always nice to see the cut content of the Fallout series to see what could have been. A surprising amount of people have suggested this one over the past couple of months, most recently, Leet Worm on the Discord. One of my childhood friends even went as far as to kill 3Dog over this when Fallout 3 came out because he thought he had tricked him. In Fallout 3, if you start the quest Galaxy News Radio after finding your dad, 3Dog will offer the location of a military weapons cache as a reward for helping with the good fight. You can get this option with a speech check before you find James, but you run the risk of being locked out of it entirely if you fail. After going to the museum and grabbing the Virgo 2 dish, we take it to the Washington Monument and boost the signal of Galaxy News Radio. Returning to 3Dog, he will give us a holotape that points to Hamilton's hideaway as the location of the cache. The hideaway can be a bit confusing to navigate, and the location of the stash can be hard to find as well, nestled in a hole in the wall in the northwest corner of the concrete tunnels. Inside, we can find some pretty basic things. Leveled armor, ammo, a mini nuke, an assault rifle, and even a stealth boy. The only way to get this key that unlocks the room is by completing the quest this way. If you kill 3Dog, the required key will not spawn on his body. So no, 3Dog isn't lying, still, some people probably wouldn't consider this that exciting of a reward. Regardless, these things can help out quite a bit, and it's nice to hear GNR without the static. Big thanks to Citizen from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, we will be called back to Vault 101 in the quest Trouble on the Homefront. During this time, we'll be able to explore the vault a bit more than we could before and under less demanding circumstances. If we happen to go back to the clinic and former office of the Lone Wanderer's dad, James, we will be able to get what I consider to be his final parting gift. The framed quote that hangs in the office that James has told us since childhood holds a few items for those with a lockpick at 50 or higher. Inside we can find some caps, a copy of the rocket launcher schematics, and a hollow tape that gives us a bit more insight to James's thoughts during the earlier points of the game. Well, here we are, nestled all safe and snug inside Vault 101. It's so cold down here. Colder still with Catherine gone. Oh, Catherine, I so wish you were here with me. How the hell am I supposed to do this by myself? Live down in this hole. Take care of our child. But this is our life now, so I guess I'd better get used to it. The overseer who runs the place is an overbearing bully, but I've dealt with worse. In Fallout 3, one of the first settlements you will more than likely come across is Megaton. Built from old airplanes and inhabited by some of the nicest folks in the capital wasteland, Megaton acts as a perfect place to start our journey. One of the people we can meet in Megaton is Moira Brown. When we arrive in town, she is working on a book to help people have a better chance of surviving the wasteland. We can help her write this wasteland survival guide, and we are rewarded throughout the quest pretty well by Moira. Still, Fallout 3 will also reward players who can't be bothered with this task, as if we convince Moira that she shouldn't continue her work on the wasteland survival guide, 
we will be rewarded with the Dream Crusher perk. This perk will reduce the chance of an enemy critically hitting the Lone Wanderer by 50%, which can make it kind of useful as we travel later into Fallout 3, though doing this will result in negative karma. However, most players do not see this perk as many will take the quest from Moira and complete the book or simply ignore her while doing other things in the Capital Wasteland. Going this route will see Moira's repair skill rise and we still get a discount at Craterside Supply, but her dream of writing a book that could save hundreds of lives will be crushed. Thank you to Ghost4079 and Garmfield2.0 from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In the Fallout 3 DLC Mothership Zeta, the Lone Wanderer finds themselves aboard a stunning extraterrestrial spaceship filled to the brim with secrets and goodies that are truly out of this world. One of the more peculiar places we can visit aboard the Mothership is the Research Lab. The Zetans seem to be real fond of the Giddy Up Buttercup toys that we can find littered across the wasteland. Not only that, but they also appear to be crafting the toys themselves and have hundreds of the horses in strange scenarios throughout this room. Some players may miss the small variation of the famous children's toy. One sits on the shelf amongst some of its larger counterparts in the research lab. Still, we can find three more of these buttercup toys throughout the ship as we progress through the story. Two will be displayed in the engineering core once we have destroyed the three generators, one resting next to a bed by the teleporter and the other one keeping Kashiro company. The final one can be found in the weapons lab on the shelf above the atomic pulverizer, making a total of four that we can collect. There is a ton of stuff to find in Mothership Zeta, but the rare item hunter in me has to retrieve all of the small buttercup toys just so I know that I have them. What rare items do you like to collect in Fallout? Let me know in the comments below. In Fallout 3, there are many places to find and explore. The Capital Wasteland seems to have something neat around almost every corner, and we can see one of the more interesting areas around the north end of the map. Oasis is a lush wonderland that sticks out like a sore thumb in the wasteland as does the settlement's resident god figure, Harold. The FEV ghoul hybrid has come a long way from the west coast and simply wants to die by the time we meet him in Fallout 3. Of course, we can help Harold with his wish, as many options are given to finish the quest he gives us. Still, one hidden option is not only the easiest way to get bad karma, but it can also be the most fun. If we have a flamer or similar weapon in our inventory, note that not all flame weapons will work when burning Harold, still, when we have one that does, we can light him ablaze, bringing him to his goal of death immediately, which is accompanied by some terrible screams from the ghoul. <laughs> What some players may have missed is that when we come back to Harold after doing this, his character model will have changed to a charred, burnt, and twisted version of his former self. Just some more great attention to detail that Bethesda added to Fallout 3. In Fallout 3, there are various radio stations you can listen to on the Pip-Boy, like the Enclave Radio or GNR. There was going to be another broadcast you could tune into, but it was cut from the final game. Tenpenny Tower Radio would play various jazz and blues tracks. We can find remnants of the chatter that was to appear in the dialogue files for Alistair Tenpenny. It shows us a bit more what it would sound like. Thank you for listening to Tenpenny Tower Radio Service, brought to you by Alistair Tenpenny. This is Tenpenny Tower Radio. You're listening to Tenpenny Tower Radio, the sound of progress. This is Tenpenny Tower Radio, music and inspiring talk for forward-thinking people. Tenpenny even had a segment referred to as Tenpenny Truisms, which featured various quotes and reflections from the Wasteland Mogul. The poor man wishes for prosperity. The rich man makes his own. We must turn our thoughts away from that which is imperfect and impure. On that vast plain of dust, we will raise new cities, and like the phoenix, spread the wings of new life and take flight. Never wonder for a moment if you're worthy of the benefits you possess. Rather wonder always if you have utilized them to their fullest. All men were created equal. Not all men remain so. In Fallout 3, we can find a plethora of references to the 16th President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, most of which can be found at the Museum of History. The site has seen better days for sure, as deep within the museum's halls, we mainly find destruction patrolled by ghouls. Still, within the offices, behind this very hard locked door, we can find my favorite of the Lincoln treasures. We can find the Action Abe action figure inside this room, complete with a samurai sword. 
While some NPCs like Abraham Washington will pay up to 20 caps for such a find, I still find it best to keep it at home and decorate my room with it. While unused in the game, Action Abe can be found in the files of Fallout New Vegas and can be spawned using console commands, meaning you can have Abe with you throughout the Mojave as well. What a time to be alive. I have always assumed this was a reference to the show Aqua Teen Hunger Force, specifically where Meatwad wants to join the circus and show off his talents in season one. Check out my new shape. It's a little weird, but I think you're gonna like it. <laughs> Samurai Lincoln, what are you smoking? Ah, that's a fine Wayne Gretzky. Whatever the case may be, Action Abe, or Samurai Lincoln, is a must-have for rare item hunters as I am quite positive it is the rarest toy in Fallout 3. Thank you to Mr. Crinkle from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, there are plenty of radio stations and messages floating in the air that we can pick up on with the help of our Pip-Boy 3000. Some produce rock and oldies that lift our spirits, others are used for propaganda, sending their message out to anyone who will listen. We can discover one such airwave near Mama Dolce's, the People's Republic of America broadcast. This serves as a pro-China message to the American people, but it gets a bit more interesting when we find the source. No clipping through the building itself will reveal a ham radio named after the broadcast. The lone wanderer can even communicate with it, causing some creepy dialogue. What do you need? Whatever. What do you need? Yeah, see you. What do you need? Bye. Hey there. Whatever. Of course, this just acts as a placeholder for the radio signal. Still, the fact that we can interact with it and the creepy female voice it possesses is quite interesting to say the least. Perhaps it would be best to just stick to Galaxy News Radio from now on. Thank you to Bubble, a supporter from the Discord server, for suggesting this one. There are loads of things to find in Fallout 3's Mothership Zeta DLC. Scouring the alien spaceship can be pretty rewarding, but it can lead to some somewhat perplexing finds as well. Deep in the waste disposal area of the ship, we can find a military locker that is hidden pretty well within the rubble. When searching this, we can discover probably one of the most important discoveries relating to the resource wars, General Chase's overcoat. The footlocker also contains a shipping holotape from Anchorage. This is an excellent tie-in to the Operation Anchorage DLC and adds some fun lore to the conflict. The only problem is, is that both of these items are bugged. When dropped, the overcoat will resemble similar combat armor from that setting. It also shows that way when worn. Equipping the armor also gave me the long finger glitch with no mods installed. When it comes to the holotape, the damn thing won't even play, instead showing a blink time on the player. This is somewhat disappointing as it would be great to collect these items for players who like to have unique things from around the wasteland. We can also find one of the best melee weapons in Fallout 3 here, the Samurai Sword. This also has its own host of bugs, where it might not even appear at all and if the Lone Wanderer brings it home, it could not show up when dropped to decorate your house. It's hard to say why so many of these particular items have such confusing bugs around them. However, it's still good to see so much detail put into this already expansive game world. In Fallout 3, we can come across many different types of settlements. The human spirit remains in the wasteland and we can interact with the people who call the waste home. One of the most welcoming towns in the capital wasteland is Andale. The people here seem to have open arms for the Lone Wanderer, and that is what makes the location so unnerving on first arrival. Why is there such an idyllic suburb in the middle of the wasteland? The people of Andale have a secret, which explains why no visitors stay for very long. They are a community of cannibals, which we can discover by searching the shed in town. Once we leave the shed though, a hostile Jack Smith will accost the Lone Wanderer, and if we have the cannibal perk, we can instantly pass a speech check with Jack, avoiding combat. Hey there, stranger. I got something I want to talk to you about. I couldn't help but notice that you were poking around in Bill's shed. So, did you find what you were looking for in there? You're right, it sure would have. You know, you're a breath of fresh air. Every time someone discovers our little secret, we have to hear about it. It's always, Oh, how can you do this? Or, you're such terrible people. Or, please not me, I have a kid in Rivet City. Well, I have kids too. Family first, that's the way it works in Andale from the day that the first four families decided to stay here. You're not bad, stranger. Stop on by anytime and ask Linda for one of her special meat pies. In Fallout 3, one of the most fascinating creatures is the Mirelurks that call the Capital Wasteland home. 
These mutated crabs can be quite the foes, still, they also possess intelligence levels that surpass even some humans living in the post-war world. A large group of the sea bugs have taken up shop at the old Anchorage War Memorial, and it's here that we can find a unique weapon that many players miss entirely. Just inside the service entrance, we can find a locked door that seems to have been modified to stay that way. Due to the Wasteland Survival Guide, a lot of people show up here at a pretty early level and won't have the 95 repair skill needed to fix the door outright. We can locate a door component in the clinic area of the memorial inside of an average locked safe. Now, if we have a repair skill of at least 35, we can fix the door, which will allow us access to the storage room. Leaning against the back wall, we can find the Tenderizer, and due to the steps needed to acquire it, it may be one of the rarest weapons in the game. That isn't the only thing we can find in this closet. On one of the shelves, we can see a key and a holotape. This will point us to the freezers below for the Anchorage stash, which will reward us with a few hundred caps and the Myrler Cakes recipe. The unique sledgehammer, the tenderizer, does a bit more damage than its common counterpart, and rare item hunters will want to add this to their collection anytime they find themselves in the War Memorial area. In Fallout 3, a ton of items can boost our stats and make the Lone Wanderer a bit more formidable in the capital wastes. Whether it's a nice set of armor or even a pair of cool sunglasses, there is no shortage of things to find around town. In Big Town, we can find out that super mutants have kidnapped some of the residents. Before we go check that out, if we enter the clinic, we can find Time Bomb, who's very seriously injured. With a medicine skill of at least 40, we can treat Time Bomb, which will be required to obtain the item that we are after. After rescuing Red and Shorty from the mutants, we can teach the citizens of Big Town various ways to protect themselves and help them fend off another wave of the super mutants. If we make sure Time Bomb survives this attack, we can speak with him after and he will award us his prized possession, a lucky 8-ball, the only one like it in the game. It doesn't weigh much and has a pretty low in-game value, but having it in your inventory will boost your luck stat by 1, of course being capped at 10. This isn't the first time such an item has found its way into the Fallout series, and I hope it won't be the last. While the 8-ball in Fallout 3 doesn't seem to be entirely modeled after the famous toy, I believe it's implied that it's the same kind of trinket found in Fallout 2 which I've covered before. Whatever the case, this 8-ball is a great good luck charm to carry throughout the Capital Wasteland. Helping the kids at Big Town is always its own reward. At least they won't be such easy pickings for the next time the Super Mutants attack. In Fallout 3, the Lone Wanderer can find a ton of ways to boost their skills and stats. While most of this happens while leveling up, we can find some perks and upgrades by doing quests. Rivet City is one of, if not the biggest, settlement in the Capital Wasteland. Inside the rusty tanker, we can talk to several people who are looking for help, one of which is a stranger from a strange land, Dr. Zimmer, who is from the Commonwealth, more precisely, the Institute. Zimmer is looking for an escaped android and will give the replicated man quest to the player. Keep in mind, the quest will be spoiled past this point in the video. The clues we find will lead us to Pinkerton, a doctor held up inside the bottom of the ship, who will reveal to the Lone Wanderer that the android Zimmer is looking for is Harkness, the security lead for Rivet City. At this point, we come to a crossroads. We can tell Harkness about his robot past or turn him into Zimmer, and it's when we do the latter that we are rewarded with a perk that some may think is worth the sense happiness, Wired Reflexes. This perk will increase your VAT's hit chance by 10% across the board, thanks to an implant offered by Zimmer. Most people I have talked to usually side with Harkness and have never acquired the Wired Reflexes perk. Still, it can be quite good, regardless of how evil it is to obtain it. Big thanks to NIL8R79 on the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, after we've done the quest Take It Back and engaged Project Purity, we will find a sleazy ghoul named Griffin outside of the Museum of History who will be shilling his own version of Aqua Pura, cleverly named Aqua Cura. One of the first things people notice about Griffin is his unusually full head of hair as ghouls often lose most, if not all, of their hair during the ghoulification process. It looks like a somewhat out of place wig, and it turns out that it is, though he claims his locks are due to the healing properties of Aquakira. Friends, have you stopped combing your hair? Afraid of pulling out the few remaining plugs? Well, fear no longer. Cast your gaze upon my luxurious coiffure, and now you too can get your hair back with the amazing Aquacura. Guaranteed, or your bottle cap's back. Wow! We can find a mess of these wigs in the Museum Authority building, inside a cabinet in one of the production rooms. And if we wear this fancy rug and talk to Griffin, 
we can get a bit of a unique dialogue with him. Welcome back. What can I do for you? <laughs> yeah, uh, look at that. We practically have the same haircut. Uh, what are the chances of that? <laughs> You're listening to Galaxy News Radio, and I'm your host, Three Dog, Lord and Master of All I Survey. Most everyone familiar with the Fallout series knows of the iconic DJ from Galaxy News Radio, Three Dog, but many may not know why he is named that. Eric Todd Dellums, the incredible voice actor for Three Dog, actually had a bit of an influence over his character. He was even the one to add the signature howl to the golden voice of the good fight. Did you know that the character Three Dog is actually named in reference to a role that Dellums played back in 1986? The actor would briefly appear in the Spike Lee film She's Gotta Have It, where he would play Dog Number 3, joining a list of other men the female lead had less than favorable interactions with. So they decided to name the character Three Dog after dog number three. In my experiences, I found two types of men, the decent ones and the dogs. It seems that men are taught not to be in touch with themselves, with their true feelings, but the things that they do say, weak. You so fine, baby. I drank a tub of your bath water. Congress has just approved me to give you my heat and moisture-seeking and mix missile. I just want to rock your world. Big thanks to Draker the Heartbreaker from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, we can find Evergreen Mills, a rundown factory turned luxury raider hideout. If the Kimmed Out Raiders and Super Mutant Behemoth wasn't enough to ward you off, diving a bit deeper, we can find even more things that make this area unique. Evergreen houses three raiders that only appear in shacks outside the main factory. The Southern Shack, which lies just past the entrance to Evergreen proper, is home to a raider wielding a flamer. This is a unique model, and he has his own ID in the game files. The same is true for the Northern Shack on the opposite side of the factory. We find two raiders inside, with the female noticeably wearing the sexy sleepwear attire. We don't normally see raiders wearing this in the wasteland outside of this location. Inside the bazaar, there are a few entertainment areas. We can find a bar with a couple of stages set up towards the back. We can see what is presumably a stripper pole on stage, which would fit the area just fine. The scene gets darker when we notice the teddy bears and children's toys that litter the area. In the best case scenario, this is a scene of a weird act performed to entertain the raiders. Or worst case scenario, this would be the darkest area in a modern Fallout game just by the implication. But since no children can be found in the area, and several underwear clad raiders seem to be taking care of business in the back rooms behind the site, I assume things just got weird with the Raiders, so there's no better reason to send the whole place to hell each time you play Fallout 3. Thank you to Chilla Chinchilla from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, we can take the Contract Killer perk. This will give us a note to head to the scrapyard to meet about a new business venture with Littlehorn and Associates selling the ears of Good Karma NPCs to Daniel Littlehorn. When we arrive at the office, it has a weird vibe. Four people sit at desks typing on typewriters, and when we come through the door, everyone inside makes eerie eye contact with us. Speaking with Daniel, we can learn about what he is proposing, but what's more interesting is what this all refers to, the biblical story of the Book of Daniel. The first hint is in the leader's name, Daniel Littlehorn. In the Book of Daniel, the Antichrist is foreshadowed by the Littlehorn, represented by Antiochus Epiphanes IV. The secretaries act odd here as well. Some players believe they are here to represent the four horsemen of the apocalypse. When we kill one of the busybodies, instead of turning hostile, the others will make comments like, Better him than me. The centerpiece of this reference is the artwork that rests above Daniel. It depicts Dante and Virgil in hell from the famous Divine Comedy. The painting is by William Bouguereau, and it sets the scene beautifully for the rest of the references here. It just goes to show that people aren't always what they seem in the Fallout universe. While Daniel's job is unquestionably evil, some may not notice the signs that point to a far more profound truth about the man who buys ears. Thank you to Kevin the Dragon from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, one of the vaults you will have to go through on your way to finding your dad is Vault 112. 
Most vaults are hard to find, but 112 isn't listed in any vault tech terminals and is cleverly hidden under Smith Casey's garage. Inside, we will be confronted by a robo-brain and asked to put on a Vault 112 jumpsuit before taking a seat in one of the Tranquility Loungers. Unlike most NPCs in Fallout 3, if we attack the robo-brains, they will not become hostile. The robots here in the vault are marked as essential, so they will only be knocked unconscious in battle. While speaking with the robot is the easiest way to obtain a Vault 112 jumpsuit, it's not the only place we can find them, as if we head to the clinic that overlooks the loungers, we can discover two more resting on a table. Obviously, we don't see anything stacked up on this table save for a globe and a few clipboards. Still, if the lone wanderer approaches the area, we will see that two Vault jumpsuits are resting here. For some reason, they do not visibly appear for the player. but we can see the item description as we highlight them. Strangely enough, if we add these suits to our inventory and then drop them, they will now be visible to the player in the game world. It's hard to say what causes this to happen, but I cannot think of a better example of a hidden item in a Fallout game than objects we literally can't see. Thank you to Azzy and Adam77 from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, with the Broken Steel DLC, we can meet Brother Gerard at the Holy Light Monastery after dealing with Project Purity. Gerard is the first officer of the Apostles of the Eternal Light, which is a small group with more extreme views from the Children of Adam. If the Lone Wanderer waits to deal with the bomb in Megaton, we can inform Gerard of our plan to blow it up. Oh, is that truly possible? Yes, that would purge all of Megaton and Adam's holy fire. I shall pray for your success. Once we set off the bomb, if we return to Megaton, we can see the Holy Light Monastery leader, Mother Curry III, has turned into a feral ghoul reaver. Once she is dealt with, we can find a now ghoulified Brother Gerard, who will pray at the town's ruins, basking in the light of Adam. We came to Megaton to preach of the eternal glow. I saw Adam's holy light. I touched Adam himself. I felt his warm embrace. Mother Curie, she... she changed. I changed too, but I'm still myself. Poor Mother Curie. She saw the face of Adam, and it drove her mad. I don't know what to do. I think I'll stay here. Pray to Adam. Pray for his guidance. For he has made me of the Eternal, the Undying. I am his now. Thank you to Lettuce Man from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, if you find yourself around the Museum of Technology, you can start an unmarked quest that leads to one of the best guns in the game, and it all begins with carefully checking the terminals that we find around the inside of the building. Selecting the string of zeros, we can start the minigame that Fallout 3 hints to the solution of with the name of the guy we are seeing the message from. Prime. Selecting the prime numbers on the terminals with this option will unlock what we need to continue. The numbers we are looking to plug into the terminals are 19, 53, and 113. Once the third and final number is selected, we will get a password that unlocks the terminal to the security office that will grant access to the safe, filled with great loot. The main event comes from the message we get from Prime here, leading us to Jury Street Metro Station. Inside the diner, we can find Prime's body and in his inventory, the Shuanglong Assault Rifle. This is a unique Chinese assault rifle that is the most powerful of its kind. However, it is pretty fragile, requiring repair often. Much like every special weapon in Fallout 3, there are no appearance differences with the Shuanglong Assault Rifle. Many people miss this fantastic unmarked quest if they aren't looking for it, as if you fail the number sequence, you get locked out of the quest and Prime's body will not spawn. The hunt is a small price to pay to add this gun to your collection, and it's worth it to do every playthrough. In the Pit DLC for Fallout 3, we come to a mill in the middle of the city. This is where the Pit slaves work and fight for their freedom in the Thunderdome. The working conditions are terrible, even by post-apocalyptic standards, and the people working in the area are visibly sick. A scene plays out inside the mill that shows how brutal the Pit Raiders can be. We find a person lying down, groaning, seemingly near death, when one of the raiders come by. What the? Oh. Oh. You there! What are you doing? Oh. Get back to work! Oh. Nap time's over! Oh. Oh. Get 
Get up! Get up, goddammit! Please, fine. Have Some your little break. But if you're not tossing coal when I get Please. back, you're dead. Some... <laughs> In Fallout 3, we are thrust into a wasteland filled with horrors around every corner. Something as simple as a bottle of water can seem like a timeless treasure. Still, wanderers should check the liquids they decide to drain into their bellies. Towards the end of the main quest, we will get an audience with the president of the Enclave, John Henry Eden. President Eden will propose that the Lone Wanderer take a vial of modified FEV to put into the water supply when starting Project Purity. Eden promises this concoction will purify the waste by eliminating mutants and ghouls, purging them from existence. Still, people like the Lone Wanderer will be immune to the FEV's effects. This, however, isn't exactly the case. If you choose to spike the water and you have broken steel installed, you will be able to find boxes of Aqua Pura out in the Capital Wasteland. If we drink it, the game will warn us that it will be fatal. Continuing consumption, the Lone Wanderer drops dead from the effects. This is terrific attention to detail that drives home the consequences of the choices we made at Project Purity. You mean, you don't want anything for it? I, I don't have any caps or anything. I can just have it? For free? Really? Thank you. You're the first person willing to actually give me any of that. Thank you to Memes Boyt and Toxic Caviar from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, there are a few unique interactions we can get from the ex raider who now calls Megaton home, Jericho. First, Jericho will have a different opening line depending on what the Lone Wanderer is wearing. He will have this to say if we are wearing a Vault 101 jumpsuit. Oh, look. Another one of your pampered Vault assholes. Look here, Vault asshole. I don't like you. Stay clear of me and we'll have no trouble. And if we wear something different, he will change his speech to call the Lone Wanderer a Wastelander. Ah, oh, look. Another one of you Wasteland assholes. Look here, asshole. I don't like you. Stay clear of me and we'll have no trouble. After we recruit Jericho, if we move a pack of cigarettes to his inventory, he will now smoke them for his idle animation pretty much chain smoking each cigarette until you hit the road again. If we have Jericho in our party when we nuke Megaton and then fire him so he returns to the ruins, he will have some dialogue about the town being destroyed and a comment about growing a fourth arm. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Boo hoo, Megaton blew up. These fuckers deserve what they got. Now, can we get out of here? Or should I just keep waiting next to this stinking hole? Thank Christ. I thought I was gonna grow a fourth arm sitting next to all this fucking radiation. In Fallout 3, one of the factions we can meet is the Brotherhood Outcasts. They left Lion's Brotherhood of Steel after the group seemed to depart from the original mission and core of the faction's motives. The first outcast we can talk to is Defender Morgan, who the Lone Wanderer can impress if they have a high enough intelligence stat by catching her Moby Dick reference. You mean apart from the fact that they ditched their mission and went native? Sure. I bet you don't mind them being cuddly with the locals. But when we came out here, we had a mission to do, damn it. But now they're wasting their time protecting yahoos like you, while Ahab Lyons is off chasing his super mutant white whale. Huh? And here I thought we had the only remaining copy of that. Anyway, I don't know if the old man's going to die from them but he sure as hell looks like he's gonna drag his soldiers down with him. But he's not wasting any of our time anymore, damn it. We can also speak to Protector Kasdan, who can give us work finding bits of tech that he will pay for on arrival. If we happen to be wearing a set of outcast power armor, Kasdan will confiscate it and give us a snarky remark. 
I see you've got some of our power armor there. I'll just take that off your hands. I'm sure you just found it in the wastes and you're returning it to us, right? Because you'd have to be a real moron to try to turn it in for pay. Now, let's see what else you've got. Okay, then. Thank you to Darty from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In the Point Lookout DLC for Fallout 3, the Lone Wanderer washes up on the shore of a mysterious swampy island and is thrust into a generational war between a ghoul named Desmond and the island's prodigal son, Professor Calvert. Calvert is now sustained by an advanced biomed gel with his brain kept alive under the famous Point Lookout lighthouse. Due to the nature of the liquid he rests in, Calvert has seemed to develop psychic powers, harboring the ability to speak to people telepathically. During the quest, Thought Control, Desmond gives the Lone Wanderer a cog wave jammer to stop the professor's influence and we see this talent firsthand, as Calvert will begin to speak to us in our mind and try to sway the player to his way of thinking. Bethesda uses a nifty trick to pull this off in-game and we can notice signs of it when around the ferris wheel. Players may see a friendly NPC tick on their compass when in the area that doesn't seem to be visible by normal means. This is because it belongs to the human version of Calvert that the developers placed inside a building to allow the player to hear his dialogue. If we no clip inside the nearby Cup of Joe Cafe, we can find a Pulowski preservation shelter that cannot be opened. No clipping inside, we can find an invisible NPC known only as The Brain. This NPC cannot be spoken to directly or pickpocketed, and killing him will only result in the NPC reviving nearly instantly. This is just another cool trick Bethesda uses to make the magic we see on our screens happen. It's common for developers to use hidden maneuvers to make our favorite games more fun and immersive, and this is a perfect example of how to do it. This was suggested by Max on the Discord. In Fallout 3, we start our adventure around the time James, our father, leaves Vault 101 plunging the entire community into chaos and putting everyone in danger in the process. Amada will wake us up to tell us about what has just happened and ultimately offer the Lone Wanderer a 10mm pistol. Most people aren't going to turn down a free gun at the start of the game, so you likely took it for yourself. This leads to Amada being terrorized by her father, the Overseer, and a Vault Guard. Probably nothing, which is why you need to tell me where he is, so I can talk to him. Go ahead, officer. You need to learn some respect. Stop it! If, however, you choose to refuse the pistol, claiming Amada will likely need it more than you do, this scene changes, and Amada isn't the pushover she once was. What does he have to do with any of this anyway? Probably nothing, which is why you need to tell me where he is, so I can talk to him. Watch out, sir, she's got a gun. Amada, where did you get that gun? Just get away from me! I don't want to shoot you, but I will! I swear I will! How dare you threaten me! And with my own gun! I'm your father, damn you! Show me some respect! Officer Mac, don't just stand there! Don't make me take that gun away from you, girlie. Just hand it over. Nice and easy now. No! no! Get away from me! Oh my god, Amata! What have you done? In Fallout 3, there's a tremendously big wasteland to explore in the former capital of the old US of A. Still, likely the first place we all encountered after leaving the vault was Megaton, a settlement built out of the shells of old airplanes that hosts an undetonated atomic bomb as a city center. Lucas Sims is the acting sheriff of the town, spending his free time taking care of the mayoral duties. So it is safe to say Sims is a capable man, and it would seem the people of Megaton, for the most part, love and respect him. And if we chat with him after entering Megaton, we can start to see why. Sheriff Sims is an excellent judge of character, and will have different unique dialogue depending on the player's karma level. Each karma level is paired, meaning very good and good get the same reaction, as do the evil ranks. Though strangely, Sims will salute a very evil or evil character at the beginning of the conversation. This does not happen with neutral or above. Name's Lucas Sims, town sheriff, and mayor too, when the need arises. You've got a weird look about you, boy. The kind that means trouble. I give everyone a fair shake, but if you do anything remotely stupid, you're dead. Name's Lucas Sims, town sheriff, 
and Mayor too when the need arises. Names Lucas Sims, Town Sheriff, and Mayor too when the need arises. I don't know why, but I like you, boy. Something tells me you're all right. So welcome to Megaton. Just holla if you need something. In Fallout 3, we find ourselves in the depths of Vault 101, growing up and learning the ways of the vault. The introduction to Fallout 3 can be pretty straightforward, guiding the player through various events which can lead to some things being missed. One of the best examples of this is when we are given the BB gun from James and tasked with hitting the targets. Most players just follow the directions, either getting through this bit as quickly as possible or outright following the game's path. If we run out of BBs during this bit, we can get some unique dialogue from James and some more insight into the Radroach. Don't worry, you'll get the hang of it. Here are some more BBs. If you're having trouble, try crouching to steady your aim. Hey, shoot at the targets, okay? That's not a toy. Having trouble with that red roach? Nasty little things. They pretty much keep to dark places, though. That's why there are always lights on in the vault. I know you can, and that's good. I'm not always going to be here to take care of you. You've got to learn to fend for yourself. Now, take your time, breathe slowly, sight down the barrel, and squeeze the trigger. Something wrong? That rad roach is still over there. Out already? Something wrong with the sights on that thing. Here you go, son. In Fallout 3, one of the best parts of exploring the Capital Wasteland is the various Vault Tech vaults that we can find littered around the area. The Lone Wanderer being from Vault 101 adds a bit of mystique to the other bunkers in the area. What could they be hiding? How are they different from our home vault? While there are a few that we can explore, there are some that we only hear about, and at Paradise Falls, we can find a relic from a vault that we never get to visit. Inside the barracks at the Slaver Camp, we can find a Vault 77 jumpsuit, and next to it, a holotape simply called, Burn This Goddamn Jumpsuit. Like I told you, man, I don't fucking know where it came from, but it freaks the boys out. Some story from a while back about a stranger with no name. Just... Get rid of the damn thing. Ain't no good gonna come from keeping it around. Besides, if it is his, maybe he'll come back for it. Comprende? The Vault 77 jumpsuit will boost our unarmed and melee weapon skills by five, but where did it come from? Why are the raiders spooked by its very presence? This is actually one big reference to the webcomic One Man and a Crate of Puppets by Jerry Holkins with art by Mike Krahulik creators of the Penny Arcade comics. It was commissioned by Bethesda and launched on the Fallout 3 website in July 2008. The comic itself is about a lonely man who has a crate of puppets to keep him company while inside Vault 77. Eventually he would lose his mind, and the comic follows his descent into madness. While it's silly and a bit on the comical side, it's really cool to see a tie-in like this into the Fallout universe. The fact that it leads to a unique vault jumpsuit is just the icing on the cake for rare item hunters, so make sure to stop by Paradise Falls to add this to your collection the next time you're in the Capital Wasteland. In Fallout 3, you should locate the Capital Post if you find yourself around La Enfant Plaza. This is an easily missable office complex that acted as a newspaper publication before the war. Inside, on a lower floor, we can find the body of Gibson. He has been decapitated. It almost looks like his head has been twisted off and placed in front of him. He's carrying a few things on his person, but most importantly, he has a key and a scrap of paper. The note reading, search the house. Moving to Minefield, we can find this house among a few others, but this one stands out. Blood is splattered on the ground, and there's a handprint left behind as an aftermath to some sort of grisly scene. The door is locked, but the key to this door can be found on Arkansas, an old-timer with an itchy trigger finger that carries a sniper rifle. Once inside the Gibson house, we can find a perfect model home, replicating the very house that we are in. The model is also locked, but the key we got from Gibson will open it. This whole scenario is a giant reference to the fantastic Hideo Kojima game, Snatcher, a cyberpunk thriller that sees Gillian Seed investigate humanoid robots known as Snatchers. After having his head twisted off in the game, Jean-Jacques Gibson will leave a memo that says, search the house. After which, 
Gillian and Metal Gear will investigate Gibson's house. Inside the home, we can find a model described as a perfect miniature of the home. In Snatcher, this model is a music box, but there's nothing inside, while in Fallout 3, the Gibson model is locked it very hard and has some random food and junk in it. This isn't the end of the references to Kojima here. Remember when we started this adventure at La Enfant Plaza? Well, this is a real-world location, but I believe the devs chose to place Gibson's body here to further the connection to Kojima, as the La Enfant Tarib project is one of the main plots of the Metal Gear Solid series. Just some devs showing some love to Kojima. You'll love to see it. In Fallout 3, if you're exploring Foggy Bottom Station, you can find a pretty useless unique item called Danielle's Book. This faded old world text has no use and shows up as junk in the Pip-Boy. Doing some research, I found that some have speculated that this book belonged to Danielle Fay, who's listed in the impound computer at the Germantown Police Headquarters. The terminal reads as follows. Department Recovery, Vehicle ID 87463520, 34578, C237. Offenses, abandoned car. Other, not yet determined. Notes, car found along highway with burnt out engine. It appears to have been stolen and taken on a joyride and matches descriptions of cars in a variety of recent out of state traffic offenses. When recovered, car's contents included two pairs of pliers, one Canadian flag, assorted theatrical costumes, four bottles of tequila, empty, one pool cue, broken, and four garden gnomes strapped to front bumper. Owner reported car stolen four days prior, but her story has many inconsistencies. Bring Miss Fay in for further questioning. Miss Danielle Fay. I can't really find any connection between the Danielle Fay mentioned in this terminal and the Danielle who owned this book. Items in her stolen car were listed. If Bethesda wanted to make that connection, they could have recorded the book in the terminal entry. Perhaps people just assume this is the case because this is the only two times we see the name Danielle in Fallout 3. My personal take is that more than likely, this book is left over from a cut quest. I can't find any information saying that this is the case. Still, I also can't find any data supporting the wiki's connection between the book and the terminal. As far as I can tell, this is just a unique junk item in the final game. So for those of you that like to have rare items lying around, make sure to stop by Foggy Bottom Station. Thank you to Lee Relo from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, we can hear the amazing adventures of Herbert Daring Dashwood and his manservant Argyle. The old school broadcast on GNR sets a great scene and is very interesting to listen to. You're listening to the adventures of me, Herbert Daring Dashwood, and my stalwart ghoul manservant, Argyle. On our hunt for bobbleheads, we will be led to an unmarked location known as Rockopolis. The flags that hang above the hidden entrance are the only hint that there is something here. Once inside, next to the unarmed bobblehead, we can find the body of Argyle. And while there is some more here that we can find around, like a holotape, the more interesting thing that many people miss is that we can also meet Dashwood himself and tell him the fate of his longtime friend. In Tinpenny Tower, we can meet Herbert and chat him up about various things. But if we have already found Argyle, he will have this to say. Argyle was my manservant. Ah, but that's really just a fancy word for the guy who saves my sorry skin on a regular occasion. He was a ghoul, you see. Been around since before the war. We met when I stole his girlfriend back in 41. We'd been best friends ever since. We got separated a long time ago and never reunited. If you find Argyle out there somewhere, you be sure and tell me, okay? Dead. Argyle. You, you're sure? My God. I always thought he'd outlive me by at least a hundred years. Poor bastard. But thank you. Thank you for telling me. At least now I know. At least now the poor guy can catch a breather. I'd like to return your kindness. Here, take this key. It unlocks my safe. Lots of stuff in there I'll never use again. My adventuring days are over. In Fallout 3, we explore the Capital Wasteland and one of the best adventures the series offers. The Washington DC area is a fantastic choice for the Fallout setting, and Fallout 3 has many things to find during our time in its world. Even before we leave Vault 101, while we are growing up, we can find a ton of interesting and unique bits that we won't see anywhere else in the game. This starts as early as when we first gain control of the Lone Wanderer as a toddler. Typically, we can't see our character in the third person during this time as there are no toddler models in the game. Due to this, Bethesda uses a trick that we can clearly see by hacking the camera in this section of the game, 
where the lone wanderer is scaled down to give the illusion of being a child. When pushing the activate button while in this part of the game, the lone wanderer will make baby talk noises. These were provided by studio head Todd Howard's son, Jake, on his first birthday, a lovely time capsule for this legendary game developer. We can pick up a toy and start moving it around, doing so will complete a hidden objective. Still, the toy box itself has a unique mark on the side that we do not find anywhere else in the game. The fun doesn't stop once we are at our 10th birthday party either. Speaking with Old Lady Palmer will add a sweet roll to our inventory. This is perhaps one of the rarest food items in the game, as this is the only place that we can find the dessert in Fallout 3. As far as I can tell, there is no way to keep the sweet roll past this part of the game, as when the quest is complete and we move on to the goat exam, the inventory is wiped and there's no container to place it in for later, so make sure to enjoy it now. Sneaking up the stairs, we can hear the overseer talking negatively with Officer Kendall, something I've covered in a past video. We can also pickpocket Kendall for two stim packs, which for some reason doesn't affect karma. High velocity tools is essential to survival. In Fallout 3, one of the rundown buildings we can come across is the Nuka Cola plant. Filled with Protectrons and nasty Nuka Lurks, it's no surprise that we can find the remains of Winger Mercier here, with a note on him that explains that he is looking for the Nuka Clear formula. Locating Milo helps here, as we can convince the robot that we are Brad Burton himself with a bit of speechcraft allowing us administrative access and a copy of the research safe key. This key will open a safe in the research office that holds the coveted Nuka Clear formula. While this can be used in the Nuka Cola Challenge quest, we are looking at what happens when we go to the Red Racer factory after obtaining it. Mercier's friends will accost the Lone Wanderer and introduce themselves as Sudden Death Overtime, a remnant of what they believe pre-war hockey players represent, with their names even referencing famous real-world athletes. Hold it right there. What are you doing here? Mercier didn't make it? Damn. How do they expect us to play when we don't even have enough people on our team? Well, as long as you brought the formula, I guess we're still in the game. The name's Goli Ledoux, and I'm captain of Sudden Death Overtime, the last of the Ice Gangs. There was a time where every city had their own ice gangs, and thousands would show up to watch them all duke it out in giant arenas. We aim to bring those days back. That's up to you. We can make a deal, or we can face off. I'm putting 250 caps up on the scoreboard. What do you say? Nicely played, and I know talent when I see it. Here you go. Okay, team, let's get out of here. Stuff like this is what gives Fallout so much charm. The people of this world find things from the past and interpret them the only way they know how. This Raider gang thinking that all hockey teams used to meet in arenas and fight it out inspired their lifestyle. It's just a shame we couldn't get a unique hockey stick weapon out of this. Thank you to CrimsonFox36 from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, one of the most packed locations with neat finds and small easter eggs is SATCOM Array NN-03D. The three satellite towers that have become overrun by raiders are a fantastic place to explore for those looking for some unique finds. One of the first things I want to talk about are the raiders that patrol around the outside upper levels of the towers. For some reason, they are much smaller than the NPCs you usually find, barely coming up to the shoulder of the Lone Wanderer. Nothing wrong with being short, it's just a curious find. Just to the northeast, we can find a door that looks like it may be an alternate entrance into the towers. Still, when we open it, we are greeted with one of the best Easter eggs in the Fallout series. It's also worth noting that on top of this entrance are three missiles, with two of them balancing on their tips for some reason. Upon entering the B Tower, we can find a chest set complete with miniature items as pieces, with gnomes acting as pawns, various bottles for other pieces, and even some electron charge packs. 
There's a row of sporks bouncing on the handrail just past the chess game, and these are pretty delicate too. You don't want to get too close to them if you respect the scene's integrity. We can find a giant teddy bear behind the chemistry set here just past the boarded up entrance. This fell is pretty much the same size as the Lone Wanderer, and if you shoot it before taking it, it should hold its dimensions after being dropped from your inventory. We can find this domino beer set up on the staircase connecting towers C and B. The idea is that the toy car will knock down the first beer, the rest should follow, but it's easier said than done. There are coffins, with skeletons inside of them, here as well, presumably from the grave sites outside. Next to this scene is a ton of empty whiskey bottles, so there's nothing too out of the ordinary for a raider hideout. Finally, if we go to the top of Tower C, on the edge of the dish, we can see a scarecrow dummy holding two mini nukes, and the view from here is a type of reward as well. Fallout 3 is filled with small details and exciting secrets, but this place takes the cake with how many appear in such a confined area. You don't want to skip this charming post-war playground on your next playthrough. Thank you to Draker the Heartbreaker and not a Haxor from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, the Enclave is one of the most fascinating factions we can meet. While we do not get much interaction with them beyond fighting them, there are still some cool things to find inside the main HQ for the group, known as Raven Rock. One of the first interesting things about the base is that it's located in Pennsylvania. While most assume the entire map of Fallout 3 takes place in Maryland, with DC being the highlight, we can find a terminal in the Boston Bugle building in Fallout 4 that reveals the location. Inside the base, we can find out who sold out Project Purity to the Enclave when we meet Rivet City scientist on a Holt in the barracks. You? What are you doing here? They... they captured me. Brought me here from Project Purity. I didn't want to help them at first but the technology they have here, it's so far advanced from anything I've worked with. They wanted information. About Dr. Lee, about Project Purity. They want to know how to start it up, and why it wouldn't work. I told them everything I could. About the Gek, about the damage caused by the explosions, all of it. I'm sorry you see it that way. What are you going to do? Kill me over it? You should go. It sounds like you're in enough trouble as it is. And honestly, I don't want anyone to see me talking to you. One of the base's walls has no collision detection, so we can pass right through it into the abyss, only to be respawned under the floor of the corridors. Speaking of the area under the main floors, inside the mess hall, which according to the wiki has 117 forks and thus the most we can find in any one area of Fallout 3, there is a fun attention to detail that is easy to miss. A lot of silverware has fallen through the graded floor and now rests at the bottom, waiting to be hoarded. We can also find the only laser trip wire traps in all of Fallout 3 here in Raven Rock. These traps also lie under the graded floor and will cause quite the stir up if triggered. Raven Rock is a great location to explore, not only because of the great gear that can be found here, but because of how mysterious the Enclave can be. So make sure to check every corner the next time that you have to make your escape. Thank you to Assy from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, in the town of Megaton, we can meet a very patriotic man named Nathan Vargas. When speaking with him, he will inform the Lone Wanderer about the wonderful group, the Enclave. Nathan will sing their praises pretty high, and this is the first bit of info in Fallout 3 that we get about the faction. Ah, look at this! New blood! Tell me, boy, you ever hear of the Enclave? The last remnant of the good old USA they are! Now, I don't know you from Adam, but I got you pegged for a patriot, and any patriot worth his salt is going to toss his gun in for the Enclave. Any day now, they're going to roll up here, and then this nightmare will be over for good. But listen to me, Ramble. I'm Nathan. What can I do for you? Why? Why? Look around you. This is the good old USA. Sure, she looks a little bit different these days, but you're still on American soil. And even if you were born in some underground vault, you were born under the United States, which makes you an American. And it's your duty and my duty to support our country and our president, no matter what. Understand? Now, there's a proud patriot. After all, if they could do us wrong, we wouldn't have elected them in the first place, right? Yes, sir. 
trust in the judgment of other people to know what's best for me. It's the American way. They're on the radio. They have been for years. President Eden talks about everything they're doing. They got flying robots all around, watching everything so they know what to do when they finally swoop in and clean this place up. You'll see. People think I'm just a crazy old man. Things will be different when the Enclave gets here. In an excellent callback towards the end of the main quest, we can find Nathan at the Enclave's Raven Rock base, and his tune has changed quite a bit from his days at Megaton. They're not who they say they are. Get out while you can, before they get you too. Thank you to Bob98 from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, the lone wanderer stumbles from Vault 101 with hope in their heart and a gleam in their eye. While the Capital Wasteland may dash that hope after a bit of time on the surface, it doesn't stop us from meeting all kinds of interesting people. The Fallout series has a fun history of allowing a lot of player freedom. The classic games are renowned for the options they give players when it comes to different approaches to character building and quest solving. One of the most entertaining routes a player could take is lowering the intelligence stat to under 3 or 4. This changes the way dialogue plays out in both Fallout and Fallout 2. Still, this is something that carried on in the series in more minor ways. For example, possibly the only low intelligence dialogue that appears in Fallout 3 can be found by talking to a robot at Roosevelt Academy. The school grounds are swarming with super mutants during the events of Fallout 3, which makes it a dangerous place for sure. One thing I want to point out about Roosevelt Academy is a scene that plays when we enter the main room on the ground level. A gunshot can be heard, and a dead NPC falls from the ceiling. This happens even if all of the super mutants are dead, or if the AI is turned off through the console. So it could be referencing that this man took his own life, or it could be trying to imply that he was killed by mutants as soon as we arrive. We can find the Headmaster's terminal in one of the rooms here. Hacking it will allow us to activate Dean Dewey, a Protectron who is now programmed to act as the principal of Roosevelt Academy. Many players do not interact much with Dewey as he is easily destroyed by the super mutants in the school, so if we make sure to clear out the group before activating the robot, we can have some more time with him. If the Lone Wanderer has an intelligence stat set to 3 or lower, we get a unique dialogue option for Dean Dewey, who will then refer to the player as a special student and insist on walking them back to class. However, he doesn't lead us to any specific classroom after. No students in hall without pass. Visitors must sign in at administration. Special needs students must be chaperoned at all times. Allow me to escort you back to class, child. In Fallout 3, we can come across a myriad of factions that each have their own agenda. While some seem to want to clean up the wasteland, others seem more intent on controlling resources or causing chaos. One group of people that we can meet are the children that call Little Lamplight home. This self-governing cluster of kids uses the safety of caverns until they reach the age of 18 when they are exiled to Big Town. If we visit Lamplight and then go talk to another faction of the wasteland, the Slavers of Paradise Falls, we can get an unmarked quest called The Kidnapper which sees the Lone Wanderer tell Eulogy Jones that he should be collecting children from Little Lamplight to sell as enslaved people. Jones recommends finding the youngest, most naive child and luring them outside so one of the slavers can take them back to Paradise Falls. This leads us to Bumble. If we pass a speech check with the girl, we can convince her to go on an adventure, which leads to her being captured. Why, hello, little girl. What a lovely dress you have. Thank you, miss. We're going on an adventure. You bet we are. Are you ready to go on the Adventure Express? Oh boy, let's go now. Can we please? Absolutely. In fact, I want you to have this friendship necklace. It's good luck. Wear it, and you'll never get lost. Ow, it's all scratchy. Don't fuss, my little girl. You'll get used to it. Well, okay. I can't wait to tell Lucy about this adventure. I'm sure she'll be so proud of you. Now we've got a big day ahead of us, so let's get going. Returning to Jones will reward us with the Boogeyman's hood. While it looks identical to the Raider Wastehound helmet, it has a bit higher damage resistance. Just don't think about what it took to get this appropriately named headwear. 
I did indeed, and she was well worth the effort. I found her a nice loving home right away. It's so nice to be able to help people who need people, isn't it? It just warms the heart. But speaking of life's little rewards, here's yours. It doesn't look like much, but this helmet's reinforced like crazy. You'll find a use for it. Thank you to Bones from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, we grow up fast in Vault 101, complete with 10th birthday party, where we receive the responsibilities of an adult along with a Pip-Boy. This is also the first place we meet Butch Deloria. In fact, we can get some unique dialogue from Butch if we eat the sweet roll Old Lady Palmer gave us before the robot destroys the cake. This will lead to Butch not becoming hostile after the conversation. Give me that sweet roll you got from Old Lady Palmer. What? Dang, I love those sweet rolls Old Lady Palmer makes. Just stay out of my way, you got it? Further down the line in Vault 101, Butch will come ask us to help his mother, who is being eaten by rad roaches. This leads to a second unique instance with Butch, where if we picked up the BB gun before heading into the vault, we can gift him the weapon, encouraging him to solve the problem himself. You gotta help me! My mom's trapped in there with the rad roaches! Yeah, I'm asking you. So what? Look, I'm sorry for the way I've always treated you. You know I never meant any of it, right? But it's my mom. You can't leave her in there with the rad roaches. Well, yeah, so I hate rad roaches. So what? I tried to go back in to help her. I swear I did. But I just can't do it. So I'm begging you, please help her. I don't know what I'd do without my mom. Wow! Where'd you get that? Okay, okay. Maybe I can do this. All right. I'm gonna go back in there and kill those damn roaches. Thanks! I've ever had, man. Hey, I know it isn't much, but I want you to have my Tunnel Snakes jacket. Go ahead, take it. In Fallout 3, there are many nooks and crannies that go unsearched by the vast majority of players. By the very nature of a Bethesda game, it's often a rewarding experience to look everywhere, picking up almost anything you come across. Still, some items or characters won't even appear in game unless certain conditions are met, and this can lead to the rarest items of all. With the Broken Steel DLC installed, we can visit the Presidential Metro. Inside, just up the stairs leading to the Capitol, we can find a holotape called Sorry My Darling. If someone finds this, please give this to my lover at the Maison Beauregard Hotel in East Georgetown. He'll want to hear what I have to say. My darling, they found me. I tried to get away, I tried to get away so we could be together once again. I know you risked your life to get it to me. Combing the ruins, avoiding the super mutants, all for me. It seems I shall never lay my eyes upon your gift. You, you'll have to keep it. And remember me every time you see it. I'm so sorry, my darling. So, so sorry I've let you down. So many have died for this thing. So many hearts have been broken. Please remember, I'll always love you. You will be with me forever in my spirit. I, I, I love, I love you. 
Playing this tape starts the unmarked quest, The Sorrowful Suitor. Heading to La Maison Beauregard, we can now find a raider named Lagbolt, who will only spawn after listening to the note. After dealing with him, we find our first set of unique gear, his armor and his shades. Checking out the note in his inventory, we can see he is actually the brother of Lugnut, who confronts us when we try to take the naughty nightwear. This is relevant because inside the suitcase that Lagbolt's key unlocks is the all-nighter nightwear, the unique variation of the previously mentioned pajamas. This clothing set will add one point to both charisma and endurance, but looks the same as the naughty nightwear when worn. Oddly enough, when placed in the game world, it maintains the leopard pattern, while its more common counterpart changes to red. Due to the steps involved in getting the nightwear, a lot of players may have missed it entirely, so make sure to pay old Lagbolt a visit the next time you are in the Georgetown area. Big thanks to Dr. Doctor from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, we find the marvelous Tinpenny Tower, named after Alistair Tinpenny. He found the building in the wasteland and hired enough people to turn it into a community. One person not allowed in Tinpenny Tower is Roy Phillips, a ghoul. He wants entry into the elitist settlement, but is repeatedly denied. Tenpenny's guards wish the ghoul and his friends dealt with, but we can talk to Roy to get his side of the story. We can get rather unique dialogue through Roy that most players miss due to how the game is presented. Suppose we side with Roy and allow him to release feral ghouls into Tenpenny Tower before dealing with the bomb in Megaton. In that case, we can also side with Burke and rig the nuke to blow. When we return to Tinpenny Tower, we will see Roy and Burke form an unlikely friendship due to our choices. Look, Burke, I I don't care how you got past the others. I could I could have you torn apart in an instant with a snap of my fingers. Is that so? Do it then, Phillips. Set your feral pets upon me. I could use a bit of sport after I've dealt with them. I'll turn my attention to you. After all, you've destroyed my home, murdered my employer. I've got something of a score to settle, wouldn't you say? Hey, now come on. The old man got what he had coming. Look, maybe we can work something out. You said you just have some uh, business to conclude? Correct. You and your friends may have killed Tenpenny. The man gave me a task, and I intend to complete it. There's a detonator on the balcony. When that switch is activated, the bomb at the center of Megaton goes boom. <laughs> that will conclude my business. Holy shit. You're gonna blow up Megaton? No lie. Look, Bert. If you're about to burn down that smooth skin shithole, I ain't gonna stop you. In fact, I... Well, I think it's fair to say you'd be quite welcome around here. So what do you say? You do your thing and we let bygones be bygones. All right. Water under the bridge, then. Truth be told, I'm a, a firm believer in natural selection. What you people did here was... inspired. All right then, Burke, uh, uh, Mr. Burke, I'll let you get to it. And, um, thanks for your uh, understanding. Thank you to Oscar from the Discord server for suggesting this one. In Fallout 3, one of the locations we can stumble upon right out of Vault 101 is Springvale, a once lovely little slice of suburbia now lying in ashes. Around town, we can find mailboxes that have letters from Vault Tech, as many of the residents here applied for entry into Vault 101. The first we can see is a rejection letter that reads, Dear Safety Conscious Citizen, we are writing to inform you that your family was not selected for inclusion in your chosen vault tech facility. Your deposit has been retained and your application added to a waiting list for your preferred vault. In the interest of your family's security in the event of a minor nuclear event, please consider relocating to one of these areas where vault tech facilities are available without a waiting list. For a full list of vault tech facilities with available accommodations in exciting locales such as Oklahoma and newly annexed Canada, Contact your local vault -Tec representative. vault -Tec wishes you and your family the best of luck in the uncertain future. Best regards, vault -Tec, Public Relations Department, Washington, D.C. 
The letter mentions Oklahoma as a possible relocation spot, so I reached out to the person who wrote these letters in-game, lead level designer of Fallout 3, Joel Burgess, and asked about the connection. No reason that I can recall, but I have a guess. Before I relocated to the DC area, I lived in Dallas, Texas and knew some Oklahomans. This intersected with a piece of real-world information that I came across in doing some general research during Fallout 3. According to some, Oklahoma would be a prime target in a global nuclear exchange due to infrastructure and defense targets there. Along with being an interesting counter to the assumption of coastal cities as prime targets, it was an odd piece of local pride for some OK residents. So it's likely I was thinking of this when I decided to mention Oklahoma in those letters. But again, that's just trying to crawl back into my circa 2007 brain when I'd had written those. No bigger lore there, but I always liked implying a wider world beyond the coast. More interestingly, we can find an acceptance letter for the Gomez family. This would lead to Freddy Gomez being in the vault during the events of Fallout 3, and it reads, Dear Mr. and Mrs. Gomez, congratulations on your family's recent inclusion in the Vault 101 community. You will find outlined in your application materials a full review of rules and procedures relating to preparing for shelter in a vault Tech facility, but we will outline a few key points here. vault Tech provides all clothing, bedding, and accommodations for residents. Personal belongings must be reviewed and approved by an authorized vault Tech Hermetics technician before such belongings can be delivered to your reserved quarters within the vault. In the event of an emergency entrance to the vault, no personal belongings will be permitted beyond the main door of the facility. All vault residents must attend an orientation seminar. If you did not attend such a seminar as part of the application process, you must make an appointment with your vault Tech representative. In the event of a vault activation, whether actual or drill, vault Tech will sound a siren audible in the immediate vicinity of the vault facility entrance, and residents will be contacted via holotape message at the phone number provided in their resident profile records. Please report promptly to Vault 101 to await admittance and processing upon such a notification. Vault Tech looks forward to having you and your family as valued residents. Be sure to present this letter to your Vault Tech representative to receive your special commemorative Vault Boy bobblehead toy. Sincerely, Vault Tech, Department of Public Relations, Washington, DC. The Fallout series has perfected long-term storytelling, and this is just another excellent example of lore we can find littered around places that are easily overlooked. Get fucked.